and welcome to Wrestling at Random. I'm Jeremy Deemer. And I am Adam Summers. You are here in Season 5 of Wrestling at Random, where each and every week we review a randomly selected show, wrestling event, uh, anything along those lines, chosen by the randomizer. Uh, the theme for Season 5 is more wrestling than ever. Uh, some nearly 20,000 wrestling uh, related shows, episodes, the like, are in the randomizer, probably 50, 60,000 hours of wrestling. It chooses something for us to watch. We watch it. We've had throughout the season a lot of sort of off the beaten path, off the wall stuff. This week, however, we get one of the ultimate comfort food wrestling television yes. shows of all time. Uh, even I, someone who did not grow up as a huge WWF fan, loved this show. Uh, we've had an episode or two uh, in the past and previous seasons, but we're always happy when the randomizer takes us back to primetime wrestling. Primetime wrestling. Uh, we've This is the third time we've taken a trip. The randomizer has spun and come up with an episode of primetime wrestling for us to watch. Season two of the podcast, if you go back in your in your feed right now, Go back to season two of this podcast, and that was episode three of season two. We reviewed an episode of Primetime Wrestling from 1989. That was sort of a, a bit of an oddball episode as it was leading into WrestleMania five. Yes, correct. And they, there are a ton of face-to-face -face promos uh, in arena, uh, so that, that was a bit of a different one. And then in season three, episode 18 of the podcast... Again, for free right now in your back catalog. We reviewed uh, January 1st, 1990 episode of Primetime Wrestling. And uh, a lot of, uh, we make a lot of references. Anytime someone's tied up in the ropes, we make references <laughs> about Iron yes. Mike Sharp and Jim Powers from one of those primetimes we reviewed. Uh, we'd go delve into the history of Primetime Wrestling on that first episode. If you go back to season two and listen to it, we talk about the history of primetime wrestling, how it evolved to become as the Monday night program. It eventually became Monday night raw. And, uh, this was the time slot. This was the show, but here we're going to go back before any of the episodes we reviewed. We reviewed an episode from 1990, an episode from 1989. And we're going to continue to roll back the clock as we go to August 22nd, 1988, Season 4, episode 33, if you're watching on Peacock or the WWE Network or Netflix or whatever streaming platform your back catalog is on, you can go back to the August 22nd, 1988 episode of Primetime Wrestling. We hear that familiar Primetime Wrestling saxophone theme song, and we're told this is the go-home show. This is the primetime wrestling the Monday before SummerSlam 88, which would be the following Monday on pay-per-view. Yeah, it's funny to think back to that era of pay-per-view, WWF and otherwise, where they weren't locked into Saturday or Sunday. You used to have uh, the Survivor Series, what was it, Thanksgiving night or the night before night. Thanksgiving? Yeah. No, Thanksgiving night at this, at this time, yeah. SummerSlam, I believe, was on Monday several years uh, in a row, if I'm not mistaken. And, and then we also obviously had this Tuesday night in Texas. Which we reviewed over in our bonus feed uh, over on uh, uh, patreon.com slash wrestling at random. There we review additional episodes uh, every single week that aren't in the free feed. We review all kinds of wacky stuff over in the bonus feed. Um, here... I remember SummerSlam 88. This that was like the f that was a brand new pay-per-view. So at the time it was WrestleMania was a pay-per-view. They added the Survivor Series to keep the Hogan Andre feud going past uh, WrestleMania 3. And then they added uh, SummerSlam in 1988 as the uh, August pay-per-view event. So you you had three big pay-per-view events now with the launch of SummerSlam 88. Here, uh, the set is... Uh, the, the set has Bobby Heenan on one side. It's got Gorilla Monsoon on the other side. And an oxygen tank in between them in the middle. 
Yes, if you're watching uh, the podcast on YouTube, the only thing Jeremy's shirt is missing is the oxygen tank. I believe I got that for you for for a birthday or birthday Christmas. Christmas. Yeah, it was a, several yeah, years a ago. I was yeah. I was hoping against hope that you would uh, fish that out of the closet and wear that for the show. We're both wearing show appropriate t-shirts uh, as is most often the case. So it's another reason if you're listening in audio form on the podcast side to check out the YouTube channel. Yeah, you can throw us a like, subscribe, everything over at the, just search uh, YouTube for uh, Wrestling at Random Podcast, and, and we're, we're right there. Uh, it's a video form of the same podcast you're consuming right now via audio means. The Oxygen Tank on set, Heenan says that Hogan and Savage are going to need it one week from tonight at SummerSlam. The Mega Powers are teaming up to take on the Mega Bucks, the team of Ted DiBiase, the Million Dollar Man, and Andre the Giant. And Jesse the Body Ventura is going to be the guest referee. We're going to hear all about SummerSlam. We'll run down the card later in the event center. Yeah, pretty wild that you had, uh, again, very uh, in pay-per-views, as you laid out, didn't happen that often. And here you had a pay-per-view that even with those being so rare, you still didn't have a world title match on the show. We go to the ring. So, again, the primetime setup is uh, studio banter with Heenan and Monsoon. And then they throw to either a house show or an episode, a, a match from Wrestling Challenge or Wrestling Superstars, the syndicated weekend shows. So you'd see either a match or an angle from one of those shows replayed, or you would go to a house show match that was previously untelevised. Yeah, basically, you'd either get, like you said, you get a match from Challenge or Superstars or something like that, or you would get a undercard match from a big arena house show like at Madison Square Garden or Boston Garden or Maple Leaf Gardens or uh, a very different setting, a very cool setting for several of the matches, including the main event for the show that, we'll, that we're reviewing right now. Our first match, we go to Wheeling, West Virginia for the mighty Hercules taking on DJ Peterson. I could not believe we're seeing DJ Peterson here in the WWF in 1988. We've seen him in several late stage AWA shows, uh, AWA 1987, where he looked like a star. He kind of had a uh, Magnum TA meets young Scott Hall look, couldn't talk at all, but it seemed like they were a guy or he was a guy that AWA was investing in. Here he is wrestling opposite Hercules in sort of a jobber plus role this is it's sort of that funnel that you saw in the mid to late 80s into the early 90s of all these guys that were somewhat of a big deal in dying territories make their way to the wwf and sort of end up as jobbers if you go back to season one episode 24 of this podcast we reviewed awa super clash 2 where peterson went to a time limit draw with the super ninja Oh my gosh, that's correct. And I believe from that same show, Marty Jannetty is still selling. <laughs> Peterson did a drop down. Hercules jumps over to hit the ropes, but Herc trips on Peterson and falls all the way to the floor. And I'm like, if if this is not a planned spot, he's going to kill Peterson for that. <laughs> I'm hoping, and I think this was a planned spot. I choose to believe that it is. I love those rare times where the drop down actually leads to a trip and meaning that the drop down, which its intent is to trip and it has like a 0.00001% uh, hit rate. It was so great to actually see it happen here. Uh, Hercules took a, a dangerous looking, but in all reality, safe spill to the floor. This was a great little touch. Yeah, and I was wrong because uh, this looked like a planned spot because he got back in and Peterson kept working a headlock. So uh, this was a, a planned spot, and then I loved it even more. Uh, yeah, Peterson, he kept working the headlock. They trade some punches. Peterson hits what I called almost a super kick. Yes, <laughs> yes. This, uh, it certainly is not a Chris Adams super kick. This would be, uh, yeah, it, it's not quite a Savat kick, a crescent kick, if you will. Maybe. Herc hits a big lariat, puts him in the torture rack backbreaker for the submission. Uh, it was almost a showcase for Peterson. Definitely jobber yes. plus, like you mentioned. And I was not expecting that. 
Uh, and it was good also bonus to hear Sean Mooney and Lord Al Hayes on the commentary. Yeah, we had that for, for several of the matches, the the uh, the superstars or challenge matches, we had Sean Mooney and Lord Alfred Hayes together. It always throws me off when I hear Sean Mooney calling a match because he's the event center guy. Uh, I never think of him as a play-by-play guy. I thought DJ Peterson looked great here, and this felt like it was a let's see what you got type yep. of thing. I thought he looked really good. I'm kind of surprised that, that they didn't end up doing anything with him. Hercules is just – he's the classic guy that's so much better off as – uh, the non-flashy heavy in a tag team like he was with Paul Roma. Uh, then as a single. Glory. Yeah. Exactly. Great underrated mid-card tag team. I had completely forgotten that Hercules used the torture rack. I always just think of him as a full Nelson guy like that. Uh, uh, that Was it a challenge episode? Whatever that was. Or we had the show long storyline of Billy Jack Haynes and Hercules. Who has the better full Nelson? Yes, that happened earlier this season in season five here of the podcast. So uh, go back and uh, check that out if you haven't heard us uh, laugh about who has the best full Nelson. We go back to the ring. The Hart Foundation taking on the team of Bob Bryant and Al Kirkland. These are not Jobber Plus. No, these are Jobber Minus. Uh, Bob Bryant looks like the third member of the Outrunners of AEW and <laughs> ROH. And they always call themselves the youngest men alive and say they were like rookie of the year in 1988. This may, in fact, be true. Time machines may have existed. I don't remember anything about what Al Kirkland looked like because I just love the idea that his name is Al Kirkland, considering how often you describe generic versions of other wrestlers as the Kirkland's version. The Hearts getting the tag title match at SummerSlam against the tag team champions Demolition. Yeah, these guys are jobbers, and I loved it. Uh, Delightfully pathetic is the way I would describe them. Yeah, Heenan and Gorilla on commentary. You'll be shocked, listeners, to know that Bret Hart is, in fact, awesome. Unbelievable, and particularly on a show like this where everything is just so basic and so bland in ring. He just looks incredible it's a, here. It's a flash of high definition yes. in an era of standard definition. How about that awesome standing drop kick he hit after the body slam? That alone, the best move of the show. Absolutely. Uh, Brett slingshots Anvil over the top into a splash for a two count because Anvil picks up Kirkland, didn't want it. Uh, the Hart Foundation do an inset promo during their own match. I love that. That's a rare thing. You usually get the inset promo of their upcoming opponent or something not related to the match at all. Cutting a promo in a little box while you beat the hell out of pathetic jobbers is a flex. The Hearts win with the heart attack clothesline, which is always so cool, especially when it just kills a jobber while he does it. Uh, One thing we did not get was the Anvil fat guy surprise dropkick. Yes, I had that in my notes as well. I was waiting for it. That Brett dropkick was great, but I have a soft spot for the Anvil dropkick because you think we'd be ready for it. We never are here. We were both ready for it. We had it in our notes, and he did not pull it out. What a rib. We go back to Monsoon and Heenan. Monsoon says, now is a good time to head down to the 7-Eleven or to do your nails or to do anything but watch this next segment. That next segment being the Brother Love Show. Bruce Pritchard as a parody of an evangelical preacher, if you have not seen the Brother Love character. I forgot how bad Brother Love was and how much I hated Brother Love as a kid. And, And Brother Love, I think, was my introduction to understanding the difference between hating a heel because they were a good heel and hating a heel character because they made me not want to watch professional wrestling. Go Brother ladies. Love was that guy. Yes. <laughs> his guest on his talk show segment here is Jesse the Body Ventura, who will be the guest referee for the SummerSlam main event. I'm all, by the way, I'm already disappointed that you don't have the music that plays under the Brother Love segments. That's not playing throughout this entire podcast. <laughs> it is a uh, tremendous song. It's a uh, mood. Yes. Uh, the so- vibe, as we can say. Jesse says he's done enough movies, he's made enough money in Hollywood that he doesn't need the Million Dollar Man's money. Jesse says he's not afraid of Andre the Giant. He 
talks smack about how he could step back in the ring tomorrow and win the championship. He's not afraid of anybody. Just classic Jesse Ventura. Heenan, Andre, DiBiase, they all come out. Well, because the story that Brother Love had said was that Jesse Ventura was apparently deathly afraid of Andre the Giant and had been for his entire career. So Andre, DiBiase, and Heenan, they all come out. Andre tells him to pay good attention during the match. DiBiase grabs him by the uh, lapels of his jacket and puts a few $100 bills into Jesse's pocket. Quick fashion quarter on Ted DiBiase. You want to talk about jackets? Uh, you know, in later years, the Million Dollar Man character would always have the black jacket with the gold trim. This look, the emerald green jacket with, I believe it was like off-white trim. This is an upgrade over that Sharp. black suit. Yeah. He looked fantastic here. He says, uh, he reminds Jesse, when you pay attention, it always pays off. And uh, Jesse guarantees there will be a winner at SummerSlam. How about Fashion Corner on Jesse Ventura? He is wearing, for some reason, he's been retired for some time now, but he's wearing long blue wrestling tights, a blue and white tie-dye shirt, a leather zebra print and fringe-covered jacket, and a velvet beret. It's like six different wrestlers' gimmicks all in one. He's the only man who could tie these uh, all these things together in a way that works. We go back to the desk. Monsoon, outraged. He uh, he's outraged that Jesse didn't refuse the money. Uh, Heenan's yelling. He didn't, you know, he didn't ask for it. He's not going to give it back. And it was a fun argument back and forth. Heenan is also great here because he's got this like sheepishness throughout this show when he's <laughs> saying absurd things. Uh, it's hard to describe, but you need to watch it just for that. He says in a soft voice. If the gorilla's freaking out about Jesse taking the money, Bobby just says in the most innocent, sheepish voice, that doesn't mean he'll be biased. Uh, maybe he has foster kids in Guam. We also yes. get, which we had several times, there's always like, I think every prime time we watch, there's gorilla being really heavy handed about something like yelling at cable companies on that one prime time for before, <laughs> yes. before about not caring and how you're not going to be able to get the pay per view and you need to like storm their offices and and burn it down. Here, the like the the thing to get across is that if you have one of those giant satellite dishes in your backyard, there's a special number for you to call. Don't get left out. You too can get SummerSlam '88. We go to the next match, and wherever this is, this building is huge. And I'm like, where is this? And it's and then we pan out a little bit. It's a baseball stadium, and then we're told it's Milwaukee County Stadium. Wow, this is awesome. It looks so cool. It is jam-packed. The ring is like almost by home plate, so the uh, – the, the, the lower level seats in the baseball stadium are your, you know, your arena seats. It looks fantastic. I looked this up. I'm like, there's no way they could have put like 30,000 people in this baseball stadium for just a TV taping. What was this? This was WWF WrestleFest 1988. Ah. Uh, there were 26,000 fans in attendance, 25,866. Uh, and it was main evented a steel cage match Hulk Hogan against Andre the Giant there wow. also was and I I am heartbroken heartbroken that we did not get to see this and I say that with all sincerity a loser wears a weasel suit match the ultimate warrior against Bobby Heenan those if you've ever seen clips of those those are always fantastic so like fun. Heenan bumping around and then whenever he comes to in the weasel suit and then just by himself flopping around the ring trying to get the weasel suit off always just amazing stuff he's just a, a an unbelievably amazing talent we uh we also did not get to see unfortunately from this show bad news brown and bret hart six and oh a half minutes of what i'm sure was greatness that's got to be awesome um here we have scott casey taking on the big boss man Again, like think back to what we said earlier about like you get a show from MSG or Boston Garden or Maple Leaf Garden, but they don't give you the big match. They give you, uh, you know, uh, Iron Mike Sharp and Jim Powers are here. The big boss man against a Scott Casey that does not look like the Scott Casey I remember. I I remember like 
made me think of Steve Casey, like jacked, blonde hair, no, young. Oh yeah, yeah. That's not Scott. This Scott dude. Casey's like uh uh he's like like a, a the baby face version of Ron Bass. Like he's like to me he's the baby face version of George South. Yes. Yeah. Here, boss man dumps Casey over the top. He skins the cat back in, throws some punches. He meaning Casey. Casey. Big boss man <laughs> is yes. massive here. I have never we've talked at length about the, the dramatic weight fluctuations of the big boss man. Uh this is by far the biggest he ever was in the big boss man Huge. gimmick. This looks like the heaviest of young big Bubba Rogers looks so strange seeing him here that big in the uh, the correctional officer uh, outfit. Boss man goes to work, hits a backbreaker, lays in big shots, puts on a bear hug. Casey has to bite his way free out of the bear hug. Casey puts on a sleeper, kind of, and boss man just throws him off into the corner. Boss man missed a charge into the corner and Casey runs in, but the boss man catches him. In the boss man slam, his sidewalk slam there for the three count. Always, uh, I love great boss man punches. I love a good boss man slam. And I got both of those things in this match. And we also got some some good boss man selling during the brief moments where Casey was on offense. There's one point where he gets caught with a shot and he just falls like a tree. Uh, I enjoyed that. A, a big man selling like that. This was not the best you would see from no. the big boss man, but he was on his way. Uh, fun stuff and really just worth it because the visual presentation of this was so different in this baseball stadium from anything you'd normally get on a WWF TV show. Boss man attacks Casey with the nightstick after the match. We go back to the studio. Monsoon's on the phone. He's talking to Chester Drawers from Boise, Idaho. <laughs> and, and they wanted to know how to call their cable company. And uh, so he's telling uh, everyone, reminding you to call your cable company to get the pay-per-view for SummerSlam. Yes, the other part of this uh, Bobby Gorilla segment was talking about uh, the fact that it will be Coco Beware and the Big Boss Man coming up at SummerSlam. Bobby makes jokes. Uh, Gorilla says saying that Coco has a new watch. And Bobby says, well... That means there's someone out there missing a watch. Loved it. He goes, you tell me Coco has a new watch. I immediately assume someone's missing a watch. <laughs> Tremendous. We go to Bristol, Tennessee, where Coco Beware, who comes out to the Pile Driver song from the wrestling album 2, which I have on vinyl in original pressing. Uh, Coco Beware comes out to Pile Driver to take on John Ziegler. The story, Al Hayes. Of, the story of this match from a visual presentation is both guys have this horrible, it was a really terrible sample of late 80s, early 90s wrestling where you have the short tights, which are one color, and you are wearing them over, over the long. long tights, which are a different color. It looks so bad. It's acceptable for a jobber to be wearing something like this. Unacceptable for Coco Beware to be caught dead in this gear. Lord Al Hayes on commentary says, quote, Ziegler is a fine young athlete. <laughs> this man is none of those things, Alfred. He is not fine. He is not young. And he is certainly not an athlete. Now, Ziegler slams Coco, comes off the middle rope and gets punched in the gut. Coco puts on a full Boston Crab. Coco to the top. It's an awesome missile drop kick, and then his brain buster, which is called the ghost buster, and he gets the pin. The Coco Beware top rope drop kick, Adam, underrated. So People oh, don't talk about it enough. Very underrated uh, in the pantheon of top rope drop kicks, particularly for this era and this promotion. This is tremendous offense for any era, but for 1988 WWF, it stands out uh, Have you seen quite a bit. When when he hits that missile drop kick off the top and then lands on his feet. Yes. Like tremendous. Like, yes, yeah. this was more just all impact, but no, either way, it's, it's one of the more impressive things. Coco beware was great. In another era where you didn't have to be six foot two and two sixty, uh, he would have been an even bigger star in a major promotion. He was fantastic. We go back to the studio where gorilla says, Jack Tunney needs to do something about the boss man's nightstick and these attacks after the match. Heenan gets fired up, saying, 
What about the snakes then? What about the dogs? <laughs> Get the, he's got to do something about those. And he's not wrong. That's one of the things that made heels from back then, a Jesse Ventura, a Bobby Heenan, uh, great and credible was that 95% of the stuff they say would just be indefensible, just drivel, just BS. But then they'd have a point and you'd be like, damn it, he's, I, I, I can't dispute this. If this was that moment for Bobby Heenan here on this episode. So earlier when Brother Love was on, they were teasing he's going to have a, a special guest at SummerSlam. We have a whole segment here where Monsoon is demanding to know who Brother Love's guest will be. Who will be the surprise? And Heenan starts, to, he doesn't know, but he's trying to to uh, pretend he knows who it is. So he's uh, <laughs> coming off saying, well, the, his guest is tall, but it might be two she's or chimpanzees to hang out with Gorilla Monsoon. Like he's he's uh, tap dancing around the fact he doesn't really know who Brother Love's big mystery guest will be at SummerSlam. I will have more on that later. Well, Heenan's comedic timing and just the way he plays everything is so great because what you described is exactly how it is. He doesn't know, but he's trying to act like he knows, but he's doing it in a way that tells you, the viewer, that he doesn't actually know, even though he's trying to convince Gorilla that he does. No one else can be Bobby Heenan but Bobby Heenan, just one of a kind. Yeah, later I'll tell you about what actually happened in the Brother Love segment at SummerSlam 88. We go back to the ring. I mentioned him earlier. The outlaw Ron Bass is here. One of the least favorite guys on this podcast. Oh, God. Outlaw Ron Bass taking on Jim Evans. And we get a Brutus the Barber Beefcake inset promo where Beefcake says uh, he cuts a promo on the Honky Tonk Man that he's going to defeat him at SummerSlam and win the Intercontinental title. This and seems to not have anything to do with this match other than just an offhanded comment that Ron Bass could use a haircut uh, at some point, uh, but we'll, it, it'll make sense by the end. Bass wins quickly with his no-arm pedigree. He, a, a pedigree. So we're so used to the Ron Bass finisher being the move where he puts you in a pile driver position, not picking you up, but just the head between the legs, and then he just jumps up and lands back on his feet and that is supposed to hurt here it, it it's i guess a half step better it's like you said it's the non-double underhook pedigree what does it say about ron bass that i was impressed by this version of his finisher because his other finisher was so lame and and uncool that that, that anything is a step up it just always amazed me that when you think about you mentioned earlier, all the guys in the territories were dying and WWF is grabbing up all these guys, the guys that were left on the cutting room floor or didn't get pushes of any kind. And then the fact that Ron Bass was a staple in the mid card for so long. And while he wasn't a guy that was like winning the world title, he was always around. You'd see him on TV. He'd win a lot. He'd be in storylines. I just, I never understood it. And unlike, unlike so many guys on this podcast over five plus seasons where you would be like, oh, I, I didn't really put a whole lot of thought of this guy. But, man, seeing him now, he's great. Ron Bass is exactly as lame as he was to me uh, as a five-year-old. Yes, uh, as he is and now. we went back even further and watched him as Mid-Atlantic champion and yes. still lame. Uh, sorry, Mike Sempervivi, but I was not a fan <laughs> either of Ron Bass as no. Mid-Atlantic champion. Part of the problem with him too, without making this a Ron Bass podcast, I can I know that would that would definitely spike <laughs> the, the Bass numbers. Cast. Yeah. The Bass Cast. There you go, Bass Cast. Uh, we'll do that. Uh, that'll be another spinoff, like the Undertaker Kane uh, lore history podcast uh, with Paul Bear. Um, but yeah, not too much of a Bass Cast. Other than I think the issue is that there were so many cool wrestling cowboys or cowboy adjacent wrestlers that Ron Bass was just like you couldn't help but compare him to Stan Hansen. Sure. Or Dusty Rhodes or Terry Funk or any of these guys. And he was so much worse than all of them. Oh, my God. Just think about what Stan Hansen was doing at this exact time yes. in Japan. Yes. Oh, my gosh. So, Ron Bass, you mentioned he's in angles. He's got an angle right here where he's uh, choking with his, uh, his whip. He's choking Jim Evans after the match. He goes to get the spurs from his boots. He's going to cut Evans with the spurs from his boots. But Brutus Beefcake comes out, makes the save. He celebrates after making the save by cutting the whip using his giant hedge clippers, cuts up his whip. He cuts up Bass's hat as well. This, of course, leads to an angle on the 
upcoming Saturday program where Bass attacks Beefcake with the Spurs, takes him out of the SummerSlam Intercontinental title match to where the Honky Tonk Man would come out and just say, who's my opponent going to be? And it's the Ultimate Warrior who Ah, accepts the challenge, comes out and wins the Intercontinental title at SummerSlam. That was always the plan, always an angle uh, going into that SummerSlam. Pretty well done. Pretty creative, meandering, but entertaining way to get there. Uh, I will give Ron Bass credit in that one of my favorite things in wrestling is when uh, a ridiculous heel, like something happens to them and they sell damage to an inanimate object that they have an (laughs) attachment to like it is a part of their own body and they are feeling pain. When when Beefcake cut the whip, Miss Betsy, uh, he was freaking out when he cut up the hat. Like he was selling actual pain. Uh, it's always a, a disgusting trip to Fashion Corner at the Brutus Beefcake. Uh, like he he would have the most beefer. revealing he'd have the most revealed God beefer. He would have the most revealing outfit in stardom right now with those pants. Like what is he doing? We go to the SummerSlam '88 report with Mean Gene Okerlund. He runs down the card: Mega Powers, Mega Bucks, Demolition, Heart Foundation for the tag titles, Beefcake, Honky Tonk Man for the IC title. Powers of Pain versus the Bolsheviks. Ugh. Jake the Snake Roberts versus Hercules. British Bulldogs versus the Fabulous Rujos. Coco Beware versus the Big Boss Man. Ken Patera versus Bad News Brown. Don Morocco versus Dino Bravo. And JYD, the Junkyard Dog, takes on Rick Rude. And of course, once again pushing that Brother Love will have a special guest. So... What they wanted to happen, according to Dave Meltzer, Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Vince McMahon thought that he had lured Ric Flair to the WWF wow. and was going to announce his debut here at SummerSlam. Because this turn, would have also been around the time that they had lured, I'm not sure if they had debuted yet, but you Arn get and deep Tully into 88, coming. that's when yep. Arn and Tully were coming, exactly. Yeah, so they were going to have three of the four horsemen, basically. Uh, And this was at the time where Turner was taking over and buying Crockett, and Flair ended up staying. And so they had been hyping up this segment, (laughs) and so they ended up replacing the Flair surprise with Hacksaw Jim Duggan (laughs) as the special brother love guest that they were hyping up for weeks. What a letdown. The crowd was very let down that the surprise was just Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Man, and when you look at SummerSlam as a whole, I'm on cagematch.net right now. Show did a 4.5 buy rate, which is is definitely big for that era. Yeah. But from a match quality standpoint, outside of a few things, it's rough. So you're the opener of the Bulldogs and the Rougeos, which went to a 20-minute draw. I bet that was really good, and it has a 6.53 rating on Cage Match. It was fine. Dynamite was like still broken uh at this point yeah so you you go from there though you have uh five matches in a row that are under 3.0 rating on cage match (laughs) bad news patera 2.84 rude jyd 2.48 powers of pain in the bolsheviks 2.54 no rating for warrior and hockey because it was too short and 31 seconds and 2.60 for Dino Bravo and Don Morocco until we get to the uh, the tag title match with the Demolition and the Heart Foundation, 6.21. And then uh, the rest of the stuff, nothing great. Main event, 6.44. Um, but yeah, not, uh, not the best in-ring show of all time. Fun fact about SummerSlam 88. Uh, it was the f- it was the first pay-per-view event that I uh, that I got. And really? Uh, that I actually got, got via pay-per-view. Um, and I wasn't allowed to uh we we didn't have the 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 ability to 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 actually get the pay-per-view at my house at this time so my my neighbor uh i convinced my neighbor to buy the pay-per-view and he had a vcr Ah, where he was going to record it for me and so then uh later on in the week i went over there and got to because we didn't have a VCR at my house. I had to go over to the neighbor's house to watch and watch it the, there. The videotape that was recorded off the pay per view, and I watched it over there. Uh, that was how I watched my first pay per view. 
I remember something similar a, a couple of years later with me where our cable company, for whatever reason, did not carry the WCW New Japan Super Show one, which mm. I was I was dying to see, having you know been a fan of the great Muda, seeing the clips of Jushin Liger. So I went over to my friend's house to watch it, but I would always tape wrestling as well and watch it later because I was a freak. And so I brought my tape. I didn't know that they recorded all their stuff on their VCR in SP, huh. which was a shorter length. Yes, and no I, more than I, two hours. No two and hours. And I think yeah. I had like Starcade 91 on the tape already. So I had already had three hours of it. So there's really, in essence, only one hour of SP length. So halfway through the Super Show, the tape stops recording, and I freaked out. Oh. But I at least got to watch the show live. But I remember, like, of all the shows, to not have a, a, a proper recording of that one. We go back to Milwaukee Stadium here. The Sam Houston is taking on King Haku. This was all Sam Houston early. Haku cuts him off with a press slam, but drops him throat first across the top rope with it. They're in, they were working the pace here yeah. from these two guys compared to anything else on this show. Uh, the, the early sequence where there's the, uh, uh, the duck clothesline and then they each hit each other with cross bodies. That was some, some intense stuff for this show. This was really good. Houston almost hits a sling blade. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't know that he intended to, uh, but yes. Uh, also, Al, Lord Al Hayes finding all the different ways in the dictionary to talk about Sam Houston being really skinny without yeah. saying he's really skinny. He said, what was the quote? He says he has sinewy strength. I was like, wow, you go, Al. Yeah, he did. He he, he said everything except comparing him to Kendall Windham. That yes. was the only thing he left yes. on the table. Exactly. Haku hits a kick to the head and a jumping headbutt for the pin. Haku is your winner. We go back to the studio. Well, we should just touch on the ridiculousness briefly of King Haku. If you only are familiar with Haku as Ming, Haku, just a wild man, Haku being the king in the WWF, wearing purple, coming out with a crown and a robe, and doing the royal hand wave, it's just ridiculous. I don't know how he didn't break every time he did this. Uh, it, it, it's so dumb, but highly entertaining. Monsoon off the phone. He's laughing. He says uh, Heenan has promised all these people tickets to SummerSlam, and SummerSlam has been sold out for weeks. So he's laughing because all these people are calling, uh, saying that uh, that they were promised tickets, and Heenan can't deliver the tickets. And uh, th this is all tremendous. He's uh, he said some of them were uh, airline workers that uh, he promised tickets to, and now uh, uh, the, so he could get a first class upgrade. And now uh, they're calling to collect on the tickets; they can't get them. So now he's worried he can never fly through Chicago again. <laughs> the best part of this to me uh, is like Gorilla. He he's on the phone. He hangs up. He said he tells Bobby that he, meaning Bobby Heen, is in deep trouble. He won't tell Bobby why he's in trouble. And Bobby is freaking out. He says, don't ruin my week. And then he just blurts out, do you have a snake here? <laughs> like, he thinks that might be what's going on. Like, his mind is just going through every possible thing that could ruin his life. And it's settled on a snake. Hacksaw Jim Duggan taking on the Honky Tonk Man. Hacksaw, super popular. The people are this going nuts for Duggan. Oh, they're going nuts. And this, by, by prime time standards, is a bigger match than you normally get from one of these big house shows. Uh, it, it, it's Honky Tonk Man and Jim Duggan, so barely anything happens. But from a name standpoint, it's fairly big. Uh, I also noticed from a fashion corner uh, standpoint, Hacksaw Jim Duggan with dark navy blue short tights, which I don't remember him wearing in the WWF. That was much more of his mid-south look the dark blue or the black usually he would have the more bright blue all duggan which means punches and yelling ho a whole bunch honky cut off duggan but that doesn't last long duggan with a comeback this was not good duggan goes for his three-point stance clothesline but jimmy hart trips duggan the ref saw it and dqs the honky tonk man Honky takes a wild swing with the guitar and misses. So Duggan grabs his two by four and 
Honky Tonk Man runs away, uh, but uh, Duggan ends up smashing the guitar with the two by four, and that's the end of your segment. Everybody's happy. This was a complete nothing match, but this crowd reacted like it was the greatest thing they had ever seen, particularly for that post-match with Duggan chasing Honky and Jimmy Hart, destroying the guitar. They lost their minds. All I could think, though, watching this is just the transformation in a few short years from big, scary, rugged brawler Jim Duggan, Hacksaw Duggan, Hacksaw Dugan, as Bill Watts would call him in Mid-South, to this guy that's basically the WWF's mascot. Like, he is not a guy who was incapable of having a really good match in Mid-South, and yet I've never seen him in anything other than terrible matches in the WWF, and it's not like he had a physical breakdown during that no. time period. It's just, it, it's so, I guess just different things were needed from him, but all it's just, ugh, I, I hate WWF Hacksaw Jim Duggan, and I love Mid-South Jim Duggan, but they're the same guy. We close out with that uh, monsoon Heenan segment talking about uh, uh, talking about the not being able to travel through Chicago and everything. Heenan, tremendous. He's oh. selling. He's accidentally choking on his uh, his water, and he's he's just he just tremendous. Uh, close to the show here for Bobby Heenan. We're told the U.S. Open is going to preempt uh, prime time for the next two weeks. That was always a common thing. It was like U.S. Open. You wouldn't get prime time, or the dog show would be on, and you wouldn't get prime time. Yes, exactly. The dog show I would get annoyed with because I wasn't a dog show guy. U.S. Open didn't bother me because I was a huge tennis fan growing up. So I'm gonna see Jimmy Connors and John McEnroe yell instead of wrestlers yell. Uh, it's all gonna be good. I was convinced though at the end of this, uh, where Bobby is coughing and freaking out, Gorilla hands him the oxygen. I was 100% sure that that oxygen tank was actually going to be a helium tank, and we were going to get helium <laughs> voice Bobby Heenan to close the show, but sadly we did not. Favorite thing on this show for you? There's no way it's ever anything other than Bobby Heenan and Gorilla Monsoon Always. doing Bobby Heenan and Gorilla Monsoon things on primetime wrestling. Bobby in particular was great, even by Bobby Heenan standards. Uh, outside of that, to me, I would say it was like, the first minute of King Haku and Sam Houston. I was not expecting those guys to go as hard and fast as they were. And then honorable mention to Bret Hart doing Bret Hart things in limited time. I was going to say honorable mention for Bret Hart, honorable mention for Coco Beware's top rope yes. drop kick, and uh, honorable mention for the baseball stadium. What a cool... Yes. What what a, what a surprising visual and just a cool look for a random house show type of thing. That is 100% the correct answer, particularly juxtaposed with Bristol, Tennessee and Wheeling, West Virginia. Uh, just random mid-size arenas shot and staged exactly like every WWF taping from 1987 to 1992. Uh, like they look great visually, but it's just... You know, it is what it is seeing this baseball stadium and seeing it jam packed. Like there were maybe five or six yeah, rows so in the upper people. deck that were empty, but otherwise it was packed. It was red hot. It also, by the way, it looked hot. Big boss man was sweating his ass off, not just figuratively, but literally uh, while wearing that, uh, that police man outfit. Worst thing on this show for you. Oh man, that's, I don't know. I'm trying to, I mean, unlike some of the primetime episodes we've watched and reviewed where you get guys and you see them in the ring like, oh, God, and then the match goes 12 minutes, nothing went long. Like, we had to watch Ron Bass, but it didn't but go that long. it was part long. of an angle, so it was, it was more part of an interesting angle. than any Ron Bass thing we're used to. Exactly. It wasn't Ron Bass, you know, against Barry Horowitz or something. I mean, having to see Brutus Beefcake's tights, is is never a positive um brother love show is the worst thing for me yes i mean 100 100 percent. it's always too long it's always annoying it's never cute or clever but it's used to move angles forward yeah. way more than you want it to be it's yeah for something that's so bad so one note so drawn out it really is the vehicle for so many, so many big angles that set up big things. Like 
not even Jesse Ventura could save this segment. That's how how bad it was. But it's always great to uh, to to take another trip to primetime. Our third 100%. randomizer poll for you know the, the, we always, we always say the randomizer giveth and it taketh away. So it, it gave us three prime times, but it also gave us three NWA TNAs. Yes, <laughs> so. yes. Primetime is always a great palate cleanser. It doesn't always work out this way, but it's one of those things where you hope after a particularly rough show that you've had to review that you're going to get a prime time or something in that realm or a WCW Saturday night from, you know, the, the early to mid nineties, something like that, that you just, you can watch. It's not going to annoy the hell out of you and you're going to have a good time with it. The best way to find out what we're reviewing next is to be following us on all the social media platforms at wrestle at random there. We post what's coming up this Sunday, what's coming up on the Patreon and the bonus content and uh, make sure that uh, if you can't support the show financially by by signing up for the Patreon, you support us by telling your wrestling fan friends about the show. Uh, wrestling fans know other wrestling fans, so make sure you tell them about the show. Have them take a trip down memory lane with us. And with that, we're going to wrap it up. We're going to call it a podcast. Adam, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy. And it goes without saying when we review an episode of Primetime Wrestling. Thank you, Bobby Heenan and Gorilla Monsoon, the gift that keeps on giving. Thanks again, everyone, for listening. We'll talk to you again next time.